Chapter sixty one, the method of ridding a gardener of dormice that eats his peaches, not on the same night as he stated, but the next morning the Count of Monte Cristo went out by the barrier d'Enfer, taking the road to Orleans, leaving the village of Linas, without stopping at the telegraph, which at the moment the Count passed threw out its long bony arms. He reached the tower of. Montehari, situated as everyone knows upon the highest point of the plain of that name, at the foot of the hill, the count dismounted and began to ascend the mountain by a little winding path, about eighteen inches wide. When he reached the summit, he found himself stopped by a hedge, upon which green fruit had succeeded to red and white flowers. Monte Cristo looked for the door. Of the enclosure, and was not long to finding it. It was a little wooden gate, working on willow hinges, and fastened with a nail and string. The count soon understood its mechanism, and the door opened. He then found himself in a little garden, about twenty feet long by twelve wide, bounded on one side by part of the hedge, in which was formed the ingenious machine we have named a door. The un- and on the other by the old tower, covered with ivy and studded with wild flowers, no one would have thought to have seen it thus wrinkled and yet adorned, like an old lady whose grandchildren come to greet her on her birthday, that it could have related some terrible scenes, if it could have added a voice to the menacing ears, which an old proverb awarded to the walls. The garden was crossed by a path of red gravel, edged by a border of thick box of many years' growth, and of a tone and color that would have delighted the heart of Delacroix, our modern Rubens. The path was formed by, in the shape of a figure eight, thus in its windings, make a walk of sixty feet in a garden of only twenty. Never had Flora, the fresh and smiling goddess of gardeners, been honored with a purer or more minute worship than that which was paid to her in this little enclosure. In fact, the twenty rose trees which formed the parterre not only bore the mark of the fly, nor was there to be seen any of these clusters of green insects, which destroy plants growing in a damp soil. And yet it was not because the damp had been excluded from the garden. The earth, black as soot, the thick foliage of the trees, told it was there. Besides, had naturally, had natural humidity been wanting, it could have been immediately supplied by artificial means. Thanks to a tank of water sunk in one of the corners of the garden, and upon which were stationed a frog and a toad, who, from antipathy. No doubt, always remained on the two opposite sides of the basin. There was not a blade of grass to be seen in the path, nor a weed in the flower beds. No fine lady ever trained and watered her geraniums, her cactus, and her rhododendrons in her porcelain jardinier with more pains than this hitherto unseen gardener bestowed upon his little enclosure. Monte Cristo stopped after having closed the door and fastened the string to the nail, and cast a look around. The men at the telegraph said he must either encourage a gardener to devote himself passionately to agriculture. Suddenly, he struck himself against something crouching behind a wheelbarrow filled with leaves. This something rose, uttering an exclamation of astonishment. And Monte Cristo found himself facing a man about fifty years old, who was plucking strawberries, which he was placing upon vine leaves. He had twelve leaves, and about as many strawberries, which, on rising suddenly, he let fall from his hand. "You're gathering your crop, sir," said Monte Cristo, smiling. "Excuse me, sir," replied the man, raising his hand to his cap. "I am not up there, I know, but I have only just come down." Do not let me interfere with you in anything, my friend," said the count. "Gather your strawberries, if indeed there are any left. I have ten left," said the man. "For here are eleven, and I had twenty-one, five more than last year. But I am not surprised. 
The spring has been warm this year, and strawberries require heat, sir. This is the reason that instead of the sixteen I had, I had last year, I have this year. You see, eleven already plucked, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Ah, I missed three. They were here last night, sir. I am sure they were here. I counted them. It must be the son of Mir Simon who has stolen them. I saw him strolling about here this morning. Ah,、oh, the young rascal, stealing in a garden. He does not know where that may lead him to. Certainly, it is wrong," said Monte Cristo. "But you should take into co- consideration the youth and greediness of the delinquent." "Of course," said the gardener. "But that does not make it the less unpleasant." "But, sir, once more I beg pardon. Perhaps you are an officer that I am detaining here." And he glanced timidly at the count's blue coat. "Calm yourself, my friend," said the count, with that smile which, at his will, became so terrible. Or benevolent, and which this time beamed only with a latter expression. I am not an inspector, but a traveller conducted here by a curiosity he half repents of, since he causes you to lose your time. Ah, my time is not valuable," replied the man, with a melancholy smile. Still, it belongs to the government, and I ought not to waste it. But having received the signal that I must rest, I might rest for an hour. Here he glanced at the sundial, for there was everything in the enclosure of Mont Harry, even a sundial. And having ten minutes before me, and my strawberries being ripe, even a day longer. By the by, sir, do you think dormice eat them? Indeed, I should think not," replied Monte Cristo. "Dormice are bad neighbors for us, who do not eat them." Preserved, as the Romans did. What did the Romans eat them? Said the gardener. Eat dormice? I have read so in Petronius, said the count. Really, they can be nice, though they do say fat as a dormouse. It is not a w- w- wonder they are fat, sleeping all the blessed day and only waking to eat all night. Listen, last year I had four apricots. They stole one. I had only one nectar ring, only one. Well, sir, they ate half of it on the wall. A splendid nectar ring. I never ate it better. You ate it? That is to say, the half that was left. You understand? It was ex- ex- exquisite, sir. Ah, those gentlemen never chose the worst morsels, like Mayor Simmons' son, who had not chosen the worst strawberries. But this year, continued the horticulturist. I'll take care it shall not happen, even if I should be forced to sit up the whole night to watch when the strawberries are ripe. Monte Cristo had seen enough. Every man has a devouring passion in his heart, as every fruit has its worm. That of the man at the telegraph was horticulture. He began gathering the wine leaves, vine leaves, which screened the sun from the grapes. And won the heart of the gardener. Did you come here, sir, to see the telegraph? He said, "Yes, if it be not contrary to the rules." Oh no," said the gardener. "There are no orders against doing so, since there is nothing dangerous, and no one knows what we are saying." "Yes, Evan, I have been told," said the count, "that you do not yourselves understand the signals you repeat." "Certainly, sir, and that is what I like the best." Said the man, smiling. Why do you like that best? Because then I have no responsibility. I am a machine then, and nothing else. And as long as I work, nothing more is required of me. It is possible," said Monte Cristo to himself, "that I can have met with a man that has no ambition. That would spoil my plans." <laughs> Sir," said the gardener, glancing at the sundial, "the ten minutes are nearly expired." I must return to my post. Will you go up with me? I follow you. Monte Cristo entered the tower, which was divided into three stages. The lowest containing gardening implements such as spades, rakes, watering pots, hung against the wall. This wall all the furniture. The second was the usual dwelling, or rather a sleeping place for the man. It contained a few poor articles of household furniture: a bed, a table, two chairs, a, to- a stone pitcher. And some dry herbs hung up to the ceiling, 
which the count recognized as sweet peas, and of which the good man was preserving the seeds, having labeled them with as much care as if he had been master botanist in the Jardin des Plantes. Does it require much study to learn the art of telegraphing, sir? asked Monte Cristo. The study does not take long. It was acting a supernumerary Su- a supernumerary that was so tedious. And what is the pay? A thousand francs, sir. It is nothing. No, but when we are lodged, as you perceive. Monte Cristo looked at the room. They passed on the third stage. It was the room of the telegraph. Monte Cristo looked in turns at the two iron handles by which the machine was worked. It is very interesting, he said. But it must be very tedious for a lifetime. Yes, at first my neck was cramped with, with with looking at it. But at the end of a year or two I became used to it. And then we have our hours of recreation and our holidays. Holidays? Yes. When? When we have a fog. Ah, to be sure. Those are, are indeed holidays to me. I go into the garden, I plant, I prune, I trim, I trim. I kill the insects all day long. How long have you been here? Ten years, and five as a supernumerary make fifteen. You are fifty-five years old. How long must you have served to claim the pension? Oh, sir, twenty-five years. And how much is the pension? A hundred crowns. Poor humanity, murmured Monte Cristo. What did you say, sir? asked the man. I was saying it, it was very interesting. What was? All you were showing me. And you really understood none of the signals. None at all. And have you never tried to understand them? Never. Why should I? But still, there are some signals only addressed to you. Certainly. And do you not understand them? They are always the same. And they mean nothing new. You have an hour or tomorrow. That's simple enough, said the Count. But look, is not your correspondent putting itself in motion? Ah, yes. Thank you, sir. And what is it saying? Anything you understand? Yes, it asks if I'm ready. And you reply? By the same sign, which at the same time tells my right-hand correspondent that I am ready, while it gives notice to my left-hand correspondent to prepare in his turn. It is very ingenious, said the Count. You will see, said the man proudly. In five minutes, he will speak. I have, then, five minutes said Monte Cristo to himself. It is more time than I require. My dear sir, will you allow me to ask you a question? What is it, sir? You are fond of gardening, passionately, and you would be pleased to have, instead of this terrace of of twenty feet, an enclosure of two acres. Sir, I should make a terrestrial paradise of it. You live badly on your thousand francs. Badly enough, but yet I do live. Yes, but you have only a wretched garden. True, the garden is not large. And then, such as it is, it is filled with dormice who eat everything. Ah, they are my scourges. Tell me, should you have the misfortune to turn your head while your right-hand correspondent was telegraphing? I should not see him. Then what would happen? I could not repeat the signals. And then, not having repeated them... Through negligence, I should be fined. How much? A hundred francs. The tenth of your income. That would be fine work. Ah, said the man. Has it ever happened to you? Said Monte Cristo. Once, sir, when I was grafting a rose tree. Well, suppose you were to alter a signal and substitute in another. Ah, that is another case. I should be turned off and lose my pension. Three hundred francs? A hundred crowns? Yes, sir. So you see that I am not likely to do any of those things, not even for fifteen years' wages. Come, it is worth thinking about. For fifteen thousand francs? Yes. Sir, you alarm me. Nonsense. Sir, are you tempting me? Just so. Fifteen thousand francs. Do you understand? Sir, let me see my right-hand correspondent. On the contrary, do not look at him, but on this. What is it? What? Do you not know these little papers? Banknotes. Exactly. There are fifteen of them. And whose are they? Yours, if you like. Mine, exclaimed the man, half suffocated. 
Yes, yours, your own property. Sir, my right hand correspondent is signaling. Let him. Sir, you have distracted me. I shall be fined. That will cost you a hundred francs. You see, it is your interest to take my banknotes. Sir, my right hand correspondent redoubles his signals. He is impatient. Never mind, take these, said the count, and the count placed the packet in the hand of the man. Now, this is not all, he said. You cannot live upon your fifteen thousand francs. I shall have my own place. No, you will lose it, for you are going to alter the sign of your correspondent. Oh, sir, what are you proposing? A chest. Sir, unless you force me, I think I can effectual, effectually force you, said Monte Cristo, drew another packet from his pocket. Here are ten thousand more francs, he said. With the fifteen thousand already in your pocket, they will make twenty-five thousand. With five thousand, you can buy a pretty little house with two acres of land. The remaining twenty thousand will bring you in a thousand francs a year. A garden with two acres of land. And a thousand francs a year. Oh heavens! Come, take them," said Monte Cristo, forced the banknotes into his hand. "What am I to do? Nothing very difficult. But what is it? To repeat these signs." Monte Cristo took a paper from his pocket, upon which were drawn these three signs, with numbers to indicate the order in which they were to be worked. There, you see, it will not take long. Yes, but do this. And you will have nectarines and all the rest. The mark was hit, red with fever, while large drops fell from his brow. The men executed one after the other the three signs given by the count, notwithstanding the frightful contortions of the right-hand correspondent, who, not understanding the change, began to think the gardener had become mad. As to the left-hand one, he conscious, conscientiously. Repeated the same signal, which were indefinitely carried to the minister of the interior. Now you are rich," said Monte Cristo. "Yes," replied the man. "But at what price?" "Listen, friend," said Monte Cristo. "I don't wish you to cause. I don't wish you. I don't wish to cause you any remorse. I believe, believe me, then, when I swear to you that you have wronged no man, but on the contrary, have benefited mankind." The man looked at the banknotes, felt them, counted them. He turned pale, then red, then rushed into his room to drink a glass of water. But he had no time to reach the water jug, and fainted in the midst of his dried herbs. Five minutes after the new telegraph reached the minister, the bray had horses put to his carriage and drove to Dangers. Has your husband any Spanish bonds? He asked of the baroness. I think so, indeed. He has six millions worth. He must sell them, at whatever price. Why? Because Don Carlos has fled from borders and has returned to Spain. How do you know? The Brit shrugged his shoulders. The idea of asking how I hear the news, he said. The Baroness did not wait for for a repetition. He ran to her husband, who immediately hastened to his agent and ordered him to sell at any price. When it was seen that Dangler sold, the Spanish fund fell directly. Dangler lost five hundred thousand francs, but he rid himself of all his Spanish shares. The same evening, the following was read in the Messenger: Telegraphic dispatch: The king, Don Carlos, has escaped the vigilance exercised over him at Borges, and has returned to Spain by the. Catalonian frontier, Barcelona has risen in his favor. All that evening, nothing was spoken of but the foresight of Danglars, who had sold his shares, and of the luck of the stock jobber, who lost five, who only lost five hundred thousand francs by such a blow. Those who had kept their shares or bought those of Danglars, looked upon themselves as ruined and passed a very bad night. Next morning. The mon monitor <laughs> monitor contain contained the following. It was without any foundation that the messenger yesterday announced the flight of Don Carlos and the revolt of Barcelona. The king Don Carlos has not left Borges, and the peninsula is in the enjoyment of profound peace. 
A telegraphic signal improperly interpreted, owing to the fog, was the cause of this terror. The funds rose one percent higher than before they had fallen. This reckoning his loss and what he had missed gaining made the difference of a million to danglers. Good, said Monte Cristo to Morrel, who was at his house when the news arrived of the strange reverse of fortune of which danglers had been the victim. I have just made a discovery for twenty five thousand francs, for which I should have paid a hundred thousand. What have you discovered? asked Morrel. I have just discovered the method of ridding a gardener of the dormice that eats his peaches.